Dr. Cunningham, would you like to kick us off? And, and welcome once again to our third session of today's Diversity and Inclusion in the Workplace Forum. I'm Dr. Wild Cunningham. I currently serve as an executive in residence in the College of Business. And as you might have heard from the earlier session, I work with the faculty and uh, the students to cultivate long-term relationships, as well as work on projects relating to diversity and inclusion. Today's forum marks our third year to host this event. And we do this event to provide an opportunity for our students to have important conversations surrounding diversity and inclusion in the business context. In the College of Business, we strive to create a learning environment that considers and appreciates many different perspectives. We consider this mindset to be critical in today's global and inclusive workplace. Now I'm pleased to introduce to you our next speaker, Dr. Alveda. Is it Alveda or Alveda? Alveda. Alveda. Alveda, good. Get it right. Dr. Alveda Williams, she's a PhD scientist turned human resources professional. Um, Dr. Williams currently serves as corporate director of inclusion for the Dow Chemical Company. Dr. Williams, take it away. Sure thing. Hey, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Cunningham, for that introduction as I attempt to learn how to share my screen here. Listen, I am really delighted to be here with you and delighted to share with you a little bit about the journey that we have been on as a company. Um, if I think about it, Dow has a, what I would call a three decade long history with respect to diversity and inclusion, but it really has been in the last three years that we have been uh, perhaps more deliberate, more intentional, and I would dare say laser focused on this idea of being a leader in inclusion. And so what I'd like to do is to share with you that journey, the Dow story, but to wrap it in what I think are a series of really good best practices that have worked for us, uh, but more importantly, best practices that um, any organization uh, can lift and leverage to help uh, their own organization or their leaders even become more inclusive. And so when I say inclusive leadership, I do indeed meaning, mean it in the broadest of terms. Uh, but before we uh, get into that, I've got an obligation, I think, to tell you a little bit about who we are as a company. Um, so we are Dow Inc. Uh, that is the company formerly known as the Dow Chemical Company. We are a global organization with more than 100 manufacturing sites around the world um, spanning 30 plus countries. We are innovators. I've got 36,500 colleagues who are working hard every day to solve really tough problems. And we are, we're focused on customers. We've got about $43 billion in net sales. And I always like to say that, you know, of course it's about making our products better, but not only that, you know, we aim to also make society better by um, our sustainability efforts, our citizenship efforts, and of course, inclusion and diversity. And that's what we're gonna spend our time talking about today. You know, I'd like to start uh, just briefly by, you know, just taking a look at the, um, the evolution, if you will, from a diversity and inclusion perspective over the last several decades. You know, if you go back 60 years, I guess this is, if you're looking at the timeline here, um, I'd like to point out that precedes my birth. But if you go back 60 years, you know, diversity really was about just that. It was about diversity in the narrowest of terms. Um, the focus there was on eliminating discrimination back in the 60s for protected classes, and really it was more a compliance-driven approach. Um, and we don't have a lot of time today to go through all the details here, but if you fast forward to where we are today, even the language has evolved. You know, when you think about diversity by itself, it's no longer this very narrow term. It really does encompass multiple dimensions of diversity, uh, but it's not just about diversity. Diversity is in fact just the outcome. It really is about cultivating a culture that is welcoming of everybody, and that's what we mean by inclusion. And it's also about ensuring fairness and equity in your practices and policies and processes. Um, if you look at all the work that has been done over the last few decades, there is no question now that there is this um, clear and explicit link between the workplace and the marketplace. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean that inclusion and diversity is no longer just the right thing to do. Of course it is. It's not just the right thing to do, uh, but it's also the profitable thing to do. Inclusion and diversity provides really a clear competitive advantage for all organizations, but certainly companies. Uh, the data is clear, whether you're looking at data from Catalyst or Gallup, McKinsey, Diversity Inc., pick your favorite. Companies with a focus on inclusion and diversity 
actually perform better. And you can actually tangibly measure that. This slide just shows a collective example. Um, you can measure it in terms of higher return on equity, higher sales revenue, and of course, uh, higher earnings. And so then, if, if this idea of inclusion and diversity and equity is not just a moral, moral imperative, but it's also a business imperative, we would think all companies would be all in. And they should be. And if that's the case, the question then is, what can those organizations do? What can our companies do today so that we affect lasting change for tomorrow? And so again, I'd like to spend the time that I have with you here today just talking through what I found as some of the best practices, some we created, some that we leveraged, uh, and I'll tell you the story of the journey that we've been on over the last few years as well. So let's get started. Um, I think the first thing about inclusive organizations is that they set the tone from the top. And that, that means a number of different things. I mean, we have the benefit of a very inclusive leader in our chief executive officer. And it's very clear um, that this is a company that will focus on inclusion and diversity. It is very clear that there's an expectation around delivering diverse outcomes and building the most. And I'll talk about that in a moment. But just some tangible things that you can see off to the right hand side of the slide. Um, like many organizations, we have what we call a president's inclusion council in other companies or in other organizations it's called a diversity council or an executive diversity council. That is chaired by the chairman and CEO of our organization and it includes every executive leader that's a part of our company. And we, my team, we come in and we meet with that. Uh, that uh, not just us informing them of what we're doing as a company from an inclusion and diversity perspective, it really is them helping to set the strategy and the tone from the top. When we go, it's less about inform, it's more about here the decisions that we need to make collectively as an organization that we think are going to make a difference for our employees, for our customers, for our suppliers, and for our communities. So really setting that tone at the top. Another good example, and we'll talk about um, employee resource groups in a moment, but another good example is that our executive leaders are all, they dual, if you will, so, so they work as leaders of their business or their function. So somebody might be the chief technology officer or the chief information officer or the head of manufacturing and engineering or a business president, but they also dual as executive sponsors for our employee resource groups, and that sends a big signal. You know, the other sure way I can think of, you know, sort of demonstrating or visibly demonstrating setting the tone at the top is just that people see folks that look like them at the top, right? And so this slide actually transparently shares with you where we were as a company from both a leadership team perspective, and by leadership team, I mean the top of the house, executive leadership team. And also, I think it is, as I move my thing here, it's the board of directors representation, right? And so you can see here the shift in representation just in a little bit of time, um, making really good progress in terms of gender representation and um, representation of minorities on both our leadership team and our board. That goes a long way in setting the tone at the top. Um, and it's not just the visible representation, but it is the unique and diverse perspective and experiences that each of these leaders brings to the table that makes us a better company and allows us to achieve the kinds of results that you saw in the business case slide. So the first best practice is indeed around setting the tone at the top. Uh, the second thing I would say is diversity and inclusion cannot be seen as an initiative or an imperative or an exercise or an activity that's on the side. It really should be embedded into your organizational or your business strategy if it's going to be most effective. And one of the things I love, if I ever get confused about what my role is in our company, one of the things I love is that our CEO has declared the following ambition, that our ambition as a company is to be the most innovative, customer-centric, inclusive, and sustainable material science company in the world. It is right there in the ambition. And so if I ever get confused, I psych myself into thinking that I have an obligation to deliver at least a quarter of the company's ambition. And by the way, these are all uh, linked. And so this idea of making it a part of who you are as a company, I think is absolutely critical. The third practice I would suggest is defining a holistic strategy. Um, I always say this, and I hope I can be provocative with this audience, is that gone are the days of diversity strategies that are really just about attracting more brown people and more women, right? Diversity and inclusion is so much greater than that. And so what I'm showing you on the right-hand slide is actually the next version of our inclusion, diversity, and equity strategy, which is pretty clear. You know, we talked before about being leaders in inclusion, and now we're saying we want to be a global leader in inclusion, diversity, and equity for all. 
you will notice on the right hand side of this slide that our strategy is broad on purpose. We are a global organization and so we need a strategy that translates into different parts of the world. It is grounded in seven foundational pillars and it starts with governance. And, and part of that governance is that President's Inclusion Council that I talked to you about. But that's really about making sure that we are institutionalizing um, inclusion and diversity and equity into everything we do. And the order is intentional. The very next thing is our customers, right? We're, we're, we're a company, right? So we're in the business of making money. And so how can we elevate inclusion, diversity, and equity as a part of um, the um, uh, competitive advantage that we have, a part of the strategic imperative, so that we positively impact the experience that our, com our customers have with us? Of course, talent is always gonna be a big play and we are unapologetic about where we continue to have gaps. And so, yes, there's a focus on US minorities and yes, there's a focus on women, but there's also a focus on many other different dimensions of diversity. And that talent pillar is not just about attraction of talent. It's about making sure that we create and cultivate this environment where everybody has an equal opportunity to thrive. The fourth one you see at the bottom of the um, rung there is a focus intentionally on people leaders. Uh, and I hope that term translates. Those are the managers, the leaders in our company who have people reporting to them. We consider people leadership a privilege, not a right. And so these folks have an obligation and we have close to 3000 of them in our company. They have an obligation to really cultivate an inclusive culture. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a, in a moment. There's a focus on suppliers, right? Making sure that we give diverse suppliers equal opportunity to do business with us. Um, we are in different communities around the world, so it really is about strengthening the communities where we live, work, and do business. And we are deliberate as well about building our reputation in this space. And there are some specific um, awards externally that we will go after, but it's not necessarily for the sake of the award. It's because where we target awards um, is because it's a reflection of the outcomes and the progress that we've achieved. And so we're not going to go pay some company to award us something. We're really going to be deliberate about making sure that anything that we go after from a reputation perspective reflects the outcomes um, and results that we aspire to achieve. But this idea of a global holistic strategy, and you see there, uh, if you squint very well at the bottom of the slide, that we measure our progress in different ways, and there's some examples listed there. But all of this is grounded in some foundational things for our company, like who we are as a company from a core values perspective, integrity, respect for people, and protecting our planet. And then also our cultural attributes around trust, transparency, empowerment, and accountability. The third one is a holistic strategy. The next thing I would say is, you know, once you have a strategy, it really is about institutionalizing inclusion and diversity and equity into all of your processes and practices. But we are also like really focused on our talent practices, especially um, in terms of driving representation outcomes. You know, the right hand side of this slide just shows one example, but there are others. Um, just last year, like many companies, we actually institutionalized what we call an inclusive hiring standard, where we actually now, for the first time in my 20 year career, and, and I think forever, where we actually require that all jobs at the director level and below are posted. Now, listen, that might sound like a simple thing that we just post the job, but it was a practice that we did not drive consistently in our, in our company. And why does it matter? Um, it matters because what was happening is we were just filling jobs based on who we thought were the best fit, um, sometimes with good reason. But there's this idea of Alveda got the job and I didn't even know the job existed. I didn't even have an opportunity to be considered. I didn't have a chance to put my name in the hat. And so this idea of posting all jobs, giving everybody equal opportunity to, consider, to be considered makes a difference. There's now also a requirement. It says ensure on the slide, but there's a requirement of diverse candidates late. And we define diversity loosely in this context where we have gaps around gender representation and US minority representation. But there's a requirement that the slates are diverse, right? We are not telling people who to hire. We're telling them how to hire. We are suggesting that the only way you can ever have a diverse outcome is if you include some diversity on your slate. And one of the ways to make sure that the decisions that are made are the right ones is to eliminate this idea of solo hiring decisions. So even as a leader, when I have a job open, we make sure that I am, um, I am flanked, if you will, with a diverse interviewing team so that we have different perspectives that are influencing what is the right decision for that particular role and that particular hire. This is just one example of inclusive practices in your talent space, but there are others as well. Think about how promotions are done. Think about um, you know, companies. Sometimes we reorganize and restructure, and when you do that, you wanna make sure that it's done in the most fair way so that you don't have disparate impact. Uh, 
but focusing on institutionalizing and talent practices is key. The next one is, you know, if setting the tone at the top is important, I mean, I stand by this one passionately, this idea of energizing and activating employees at all levels to drive change. Um, and I know uh, uh, universities have different types of organizations. Many of the companies have what we call employee resource groups or business resource groups. They're called different things. Sometimes they're employee networks. At Dow, we have 10 employee resource groups and they are, um, they, they have different, uh, they're different organizations. We have one that is aligned to our LGBTQ community, one for African Americans and those of African descent, veterans, Hispanics, women. We have um, those for early career, those for in, those that are in the prime of their career, but there are 10 employee resource groups traditionally targeted at where we have um, underrepresentation or traditionally marginalized communities. But I think the power of our employee resource groups is that you can't be an ERG in our organization unless you are inclusive of everyone, right? And so they cross collaborate. They are welcoming. They must be welcoming of allies. We have at this point about 49% of our employees engaged in one or more ERG. And so you may be sitting back and saying, well, what's the big deal? You have a bunch of clubs in your company. No, it's not that. It is that the business case for employee resource groups are clear. The data will tell you that ERGs drive engagement, greater engagement. Engagement leads to productivity, greater productivity leads to greater bottom line impact. Um, and so that's what the external business case data will tell you. And what you see on this slide is that we've actually proven out the business case even internally. Every year we do a, um, like any other company, we do a, um, an annual survey of our employees to address satisfaction. And one of the questions that they get asked at the end of the survey is whether or not they are a participant in one or more ERG. And without any attribution, we can go and look behind the curtains of the um, survey and see that those, part, those employees who participate in an ERG actually have a greater favorability, a better experience overall than those who are not. Literally 10 percentage points higher in overall satisfaction. And so these ERGs, yes, they're a place of community. Yes, they're a place of commonality, but we really tapped into that to activate them around business imperatives, uh, community imperatives, and also talent imperatives. They're a good place to recruit talent. They're a good place to help us recruit talent. Um, they're a good place to seed volunteer activities. They're a good place to go to say, hey, this is a particular market we're interested in. Um, can we use you as a focus group? Is there a business opportunity here? And so they can be really amazing. And so the employee resource groups are quite powerful for us. And there are other ways to activate and energize um, all employees as well. This next one, and perhaps is the purpose, the title of the talk is one that I'm quite passionate about. Um, you can have all of these things, but there has to be some level of accountability for your leadership. I think I talked about the fact that, um, you know, leadership in our company is a privilege and not a right. And we do have certain expectations of our leaders. The data will tell you, um, and I think this is a report from Catalyst Inc. that says that 50 to 70% of an employee's experience is based on their interaction with their leaders. I don't know about you guys, but that's kind of scary because in every organization, there are really amazing leaders and there are some not so good ones. And when you have not so good ones, people who have that experience, they will actually vote with their feet. And so we hold leaders accountable in a different way. Doesn't mean you can't work here, but if you're gonna have a leadership role, there are certain expectations. One expectation that's not on this slide, of course, is that we actually, um, we don't do this for all employees, but there's an expectation that leaders engage in an ERG of their choosing. We don't tell them where they have to engage. We actually suggest that they choose one where they may not naturally assimilate or affiliate so they can learn some things and it will make them a better leader, okay? So there's an accountability around, are you a participant in an ERG? We don't go check individual names, but I can tell you we have about 97, 98% of our leaders um, that are engaged. But more important than that is making sure that they are living out the value, right? And demonstrating inclusive behaviors. And I listed some of them on this slide. We need leaders who embrace diversity. Again, 30 different countries where we are, different nationalities, different ethnicities. Gender is a spectrum, right? We need leaders that embrace diversity. We need leaders that embrace diversity of thinking, um, whether you came from LSU or Louisiana Tech diversity across all dimensions. We need leaders that listen and practice empathy and those who are willing to connect and engage authentically. And certainly um, the last few months have given us a clear opportunity to do that. 
transparency in our communications as leaders. Uh, and sometimes that means just saying um, even what you can't say, right? So tell people I can't say that, but I am aware that it's a concern. Um, a big one, and this of course came uh, to bear in 2020 with the um, onset of COVID is just really not just um, encouraging flexibility, but working hand in hand with employees to make sure that you're managing individual, uh, um, individual situations. That is flexibility is an inclusive behavior. Of course, practicing equity and fairness, and there's some things that we do to help with that and, and put into the infrastructure of our processes, but we need leaders just leading with those kind of behaviors. And then of course, taking, um, taking visible uh, action. And I'll talk a little bit about that and how we're doing it in terms of our company overall. Um, but then there's this idea of hardwiring um, accountability. And so one of the ways that we do that is by linking the performance award, that means our bonus structure, to objectives around inclusion and diversity. And look, we do this for business results. We do this for safety results. We do it for our focus on sustainability and for customer experience. And now we do it for leaders in the sense of this shared accountability around inclusion and diversity results. And, and it's a balance, right? So some of it is about ERG participation because we're so passionate about that in our company. And some of it is about um, specific diversity metrics. But no kidding, how we perform in inclusion and diversity is directly linked to the bonus structure for our employees. So this balance of accountability behind behaviors and metrics is really a best practice that works well. And then finally, or second to last, I would say is um, diversifying the supply chain, right? It not, it's not just about who we are as a company, but how we're engaging with our customers and what we're doing specifically to create opportunities for more diverse suppliers. Um, this is a real thing in the U.S. Um, with real definition by diverse suppliers. We're talking about those businesses that are my, minority owned, women owned, LGBTQ, uh, disabled owned, et cetera. And we do this not because it's, again, the nice thing to do, but it really does deliver bottom line value. It, it um, drives competition among the supplier base and really supports economic growth uh, in local communities. And you can see some of the progress that we've been able to make um, in the last few years. This final one is critical. It is really um, about disclosing progress and results, right? So, so you can have a, a, a program, you can have a strong strategy, you must measure your results, but even going beyond measuring is disclosing results. Um, and, and we thought that we were gonna be on this quote unquote journey around transparency and start dripping stuff. And now um, to be very truthful, there's much more pull, right? There's a focus uh, in the investor markets around um, ESG, environmental, sustain environmental Sustainability and Governance. There's more of a focus there and investors are now requiring that you outwardly talk more about your progress and outcomes. One of the ways that we do that, um, there are a number of ways, but one way is that every year we have published, at least for the last two or three years, we have published um, the Shine Inclusion Report and there's transparency about our data, as you can see here on this slide, but we also tell the stories of our programs and activities um, that really make uh, Dow a great place to work. But there are other ways too, disclosing our um, US EEO1 report, which really just is a uh, workplace representation report. Um, there are other things like the Bloomberg Equality Index where any investor or any other company for that matter can go and see our data. Just being transparent about that goes a long way. Why is that? Because transparency, it actually builds credibility internally, but it also um, builds trust internally actually, and it builds credibility with external stakeholders. And so um, I wanna show you, and this slide is busy on purpose, it's not meant to um, spend a lot of time trying to understand it all, but I just wanna show you when, you, when you put those kind of best practices in place, and this has been a three year journey for us, this slide kind of highlights what's possible, right? And you can see there, if you look very quickly, you can see some of the really intentional and deliberate strategic actions that we've had over the last three years. But I would more call your attention to that thing that looks like a racetrack in, in the middle, where you can see the outcomes, where we have actually tripled participation in our employee resource groups, where we have tripled spend with diverse suppliers, where we have moved the needle, and we still have a lot of work to do on um, representation of women and U.S. minority representation. This is our workforce. We saw leaders earlier. And then, of course, where we have finally um, made a significant um, uh, hike in our employee satisfaction and 74% just on a relative basis, it represents the highest overall satisfaction uh, in the last few decades in our company. And at the bottom of the slide, you can see some of the recognition that comes with that. And again, it's not just uh, recognition for recognition's sake, 
it's a measure of the outcomes and the progress we've made. And this helps us build our reputation. It's this cycle, right? So that people see us as a place that they would like to work. So I think I have a few more minutes and maybe I'd like to land the plane on this idea or this best practice around taking action. Of course, there are always individual things that leaders can do to take action based on our company's values. Um, but I think I would be remiss if I didn't spend the last few moments talking about the amazing opportunities in the face of crisis that we saw in 2020. And one of those was, um, there were a number, right? I mean, there was COVID-19, there was, um, for us in Dow, we had a 500 year flood in our headquarter location. There was, of course, what was, or what is the national, long overdue national reckoning on race with the murder of George Floyd. And so what I'd like to share with you an example of when you have inclusion and diversity embedded in the fabric of who you are as an organization, how you can act based on your values. And specifically, I'd like to talk about the national reckoning on race. The slide just shows you high level what our response was as a company to take action against racial injustice and systemic racism. Um, you can see there a quote from our chairman and CEO on the slide, but the output of this was, you know, a team of us getting together, um, yes, in the Office of Inclusion, but we launched, you know, tapped our, our global African affinity network, and we developed a, a holistic approach, a framework um, that we call Dow X. And you can see there that that Dow X represents three different pillars. You know, what are we gonna do in the area of advocacy? What are we gonna do from a community perspective? And what are we gonna do to acknowledge that we need to do something differently, even with our own talent group? And all of this was about accelerating change together as an organization and with our external partners. So I'd like to quickly just tap through some of the examples. I can't do all of them here today, but some of the examples of what taking action and inclusive leadership in this context really looks like. So acting on our commitment and in, in, in advocacy, there were a number of things that we've done. We have committed $1 million to the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, um, their National Racial Equity Initiative. One of the things we did internally, we were in a um, heightened political environment, um, and it was not just because, that, because of that, but we had an opportunity to expand our civic engagement policy because we realized that there were people in our company who, you know, there were barriers based on what their jobs were, making sure they had the opportunity to vote. This is not about telling them who to vote for, but creating an opportunity through paid time off for our U.S. employees to either vote in the election or volunteer. And this is not just a one-time thing. This is literally a part of who we are as a company for both state and federal elections going forward. And then the other thing in this space was we have now this internal social justice council so that as things emerge either inside of our company or outside of this company, we have a, a governance, if you will, a governance structure to bring forward recommendations on how we might um, respond. Those are just some quick examples in advocacy. I've got two minutes, that's one minute per slide left. Um, the second one is in community, and, and this is just one example, there are others, but really proud of what happened just a week or two ago. Um, we actually, and I don't know that I should be proud to say this, but up until 2021, Martin Luther King um, was not a holiday inside of Dow. And so as a part of Dow X, Martin Luther King became a paid holiday, but we were pretty passionate about not making this just a day off, but converting it to a day on to help all of Team Dow serve in the community. And so you can see here that in 2021, just a couple of weeks ago on a Monday, we had over 800 volunteers committing 2,700 hours of service, both remote and in person. Um, we served 35 nonprofits, uh, supported 15 Dow communities in the US, and also supplemented our volunteerism with activation grants. And you can just see some examples here. There's um, a family over in Philadelphia, one of our Dow families that's working to put together hats and gloves for kids. You see me at the bottom hand of the screen um, working on a transcription project with the National Museum of African American Heritage and Culture. Um, so just a really amazing uh, piece of work and, um, and impact in our community. And then finally, and I will close here, is just acting on our commitment in terms of talent. There are a number of things that we are doing here. I am highlighting our elevated focus on historically black colleges and universities. Uh, with a total commitment of $5 million over the next 10, um, sorry, five years to um, accelerate the uh, STEM pipeline. And you can see all the areas that we're working in and we have um, specific partnership and relationship with five uh, HBCUs um, that either have, you know, areas of discipline and focus where we have a natural affinity or are in good proximity to our location. 
So with that, I hope it's been helpful to talk to you about um, really what inclusive organizations can do and some of the best practices that they can um, exercise to really uh, become leaders in this space. And I would be happy, not today apparently, because we don't have time, but if there are questions uh, via LinkedIn or Twitter, would be happy to address those. Let me thank you for your time and appreciate the opportunity. I'm not sure if Dr. Cunningham is still here. Um, so I will close out and just say thank you so much. This was an amazing presentation. I think um, everyone on here learned a whole lot. We had around 180 people participating. So um, let's see if anyone, if you do have a second, we can take a question. Um, sure. Someone said, what motivated you to change professions from a PhD chemist to an HR leader? How difficult was it to make such a career change? And is such a career path change at Dow encouraged or discouraged? Yeah, so let me start with the, the last one. I would say the, the wonderful thing about Dow that I learned early on, even before I joined, but in the interview stage was what I would call the possibilities, right? And this is not a Dow thing. Large companies offer possibilities. And so the idea that I could come and work in a company as a, as a, as a PhD scientist, and there were a number of different technology areas that my skills fit, that was great. And then you get in, you realize like, oh yeah, I love science, but I also love all these other things. And there are possibilities there as well. And so the short answer to the last question is absolutely. Um, those things are encouraged and we actually create mechanisms inside of our company where folks can look for opportunities either inside their current area or in other areas that they'd like to explore. For me specifically, what I can tell you is I of course knew that I had a passion for science. It is why I went to school for so long. Otherwise, do not take statistical mechanics if you want to be an HR professional. Like, don't try that at home. Um, so I knew that, right? I was passionate about it. I went to school for it for a number of different reasons. And I was having the time of my life in R&D. When I thought about it, though, what I realized is that I was always, in addition to running my experiments in the lab or leading some technology or innovation project, I was always bolting on these other things, right? These other people-related things. Long before I was ever doing um, HR work, I was always doing coaching and mentoring. Long before I was ever a DNI professional, I was, I had created a program to introduce minorities to um, the opportunities available them to an industrial research career. So I'm bolting on these things and eventually I decided to test the waters and make the move to HR in 2012, I believe it was. And I said that I would go and stay for two years and I would run back if it wasn't fun. And I'm still here. So it was fun. I feel like I've been able to make an impact, and I think that there's some things that I can continue to contribute. Wonderful, thank you. And I'm gonna throw it back to Dr. Cunningham. Oh, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Williams. It was a very informative presentation, particularly like your emphasis on inclusion being a part of the business strategy embedded within it instead of it just being an initiative or a committee, that yeah. really struck out to me. So I really appreciate that emphasis. And thank you so much for joining us. I'm sure you'll have some people reaching out to you. It was such a great presentation. And we bid you good day. And we hope that uh, those of you that are still on will join us for the rest of our presentations, our remaining presentations this, today. Thank you so much. Good day, everyone. Good day. Thank you.